Hi folks, I'm Jack Kennedy and welcome to this special Dairy Link webinar on soil fertility and preparing for turnout to grass. Um, the Dairy Link program, as you're well aware, runs across the north, the northern half of the country, I suppose, and it effectively has a number of farmers right, right across the, the northern half of the country. And Aidan Kushnahan is the advisor dedicated to looking after those farmers and chatting to them on a kind of a daily basis. Um, taking part in this webinar is Aidan Kushnan, the pre-mentioned uh, Dairy Link advisor, Niall McCarran from Lakeland Dairies, one of the stakeholders in this, in this project. James King is our host farmer for this evening in terms of the webinar, and we're talking about his farm and some of the issues that are happening on his farm. And Peter McCann, our own Peter McCann from the Farmers Journal and myself, will just kind of guide you through some of the issues, I suppose, to discuss today on this webinar, soil fertility and preparing for turnout, turnout to grass. Um, the other stakeholders in this in this program are MSD Animal Health um, and Lakeland Dairies, along with Deira Caffrey, um, Chagask, and um, ourselves, the Irish Farmers Journal. So, I mean, folks, we'll we'll, we'll keep a move on, and we'll and we'll take through. We've 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 we've, lot, we've lots to cover in terms of we want to do a good bit on soil fertility. We want to do a good bit on, I suppose, preparing for turnout. And we're going to start, I suppose, with uh, I suppose just to kind of get a feel for James King and the family farm where we are in. Um, in Ballymena. Um, we're going to follow that then very quickly with Peter McCann. Our own Peter McCann was out on farm with James um, on Friday last. Um, so we just get a feel for what's happening on the farm there. We're going to talk to Niall McCarran then in terms of a little bit on the soil fertility and some of the results that are getting from the soil results that, um, that they have sampled. And then we're going to move in kind of the last slot which is very quickly kind of getting a feel for how how James and uh, is going to manage the kind of getting getting the first of the cows out and, and moving on from from there. Um, uh, James, um, welcome to this webinar. I mean, effectively, I'm seeing on the slide here you're in Ballymena. It's not quite Belly Castle, but you're you're well up there, like. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> we're in the North Antrim. Northern Cardin in North Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> you are. Um, I mean, you you have your grazing block there, uh, um, James, 34 hectares, you're farming 80 hectares in total. And only recently you kind of switched into kind of, I suppose, um, you, 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 you don't carry any young stock. You're just carrying effectively milk and stock and, 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 and like dry cows, we'll say on the farm. It's cow, it's cow only farm. That's great. Yeah, that was... Um... It was a choice to maximise the output from the, the land available. Um, all my young stock were reared off the farm and, and rented housing over the winter and one thing or another and I found that the workload was nearly too much for me. So now everything's at home, everything's in the one yard and it's made my life an awful lot easier. And I suppose I'm just producing as much milk as I can from every acre I have. Okay, and I mean, I suppose I, it puts you at the, you know, you, you have to go buy in replacements, whatever replacements you need on an annual basis, uh, James, you have to go buy in them. So I suppose you're, you're at the mercy of the market in terms of paying or buying those animals. That's true. I mean, that's, that's a steep, very steep learning curve. It's, it's not easy. Now, if, I've only been buying in his last two years, and to be honest, I've been happy enough so far with what we've got. Uh, they've performed well. We're looking for a a sort of a more medium sized, stronger type cow that will graze well. And so far we seem to have fell in with those not too bad now. But um, one of the, interestingly there, I've done recent recent figures there and my replacement cost has actually is as low as I've had it in a long time. Right. Okay. When you when you do the full sums on it, and as you yeah. say, the mar so the market the market is still getting you a bit of a bit of value. Assuming you can buy good qualities, as you James, that's isn't that it? You are that type of cow that you want. Like I mean, that's the that's the challenge. And and as you say, there's a bit of a learning curve there in trying to source source those cows. Like especially for like I I'll say if you're coming south of the border, we don't have that many autumn calving. Like I mean, you're a, you're this is an this is an autumn calving operation that we're talking about. Yeah, that's that's true. It is, it is difficult to, now just to source the autumn calving cows. There's no doubt mm. that that has been a bit of a challenge. But uh, mm. so yeah. far, as I say, we have that has worked out not too bad. Okay, um, Aidan Kushnahan, just to bring you in in terms of kind of I suppose this general area where we're talking about Ballymena, Northern Antrim. Talk to us a little bit about kind of the the, the general lie of the land and the number of farmers, etc. Sure. Thanks, Jack. And hello there, everybody. Yes, uh, look, for those of you unfamiliar with the, the, this part of the world, uh, James's farm is quite close to Ballymena. In fact, James, you can keep me right here. It would be the closest farm to the town. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, in terms of the general locality, this farm, 
we've estimated it's in around just uh, over 115 meters above sea level, which is approaching some regions about say 180 feet above sea level. That part of the world, County Antrim, is uh, based in the basaltic type soil. Uh, James his ground lies on, on a loam rather than some of the heavier clays that you'll experience in County Antrim. And the rainfall uh, in that particular area, based on the 30 day or 30, excuse me, 30 year average, um, would be somewhere in the region of 800 to 950 millimeters uh, of rainfall per year. Uh, the farm itself is located in an area known as the Braid Valley, and uh, there are a lot of dairy farms around there. I've, I've done a recent sweep just of dairy farms and three local postcodes to James's farm, and we've estimated there's about 90 farms in that locality that are up dairy cows and their and, and their units. Okay, so I mean, it's it's it's. I mean, I'm I'm surprised at the at the rainfall being that low. I mean, you, we we often talk down down around here. I, you know, of Kilkenny and Carlo and that area in the east of the country as well, but a lot, a lot further south, that they're only kind of in that in that rain range of rainfall, you know, 800, 900. I mean, I, I would have put it up higher if you'd asked me before, I'd have put you up at kind of a metre and a half or something like that. Maybe James would as well, you know, but it's, um, it, yeah, it, it, it looks it looks relatively low to me, yeah. Well, it's, it's been, yes, Jack, it's, there, there will be individual variations there. The, the, that, that information is based on a combination of, um, meteorological data taken from a local uh, weather station about 15 miles away yeah. and uh, some information supplied by other local farmers in the area who keep a rain gauge. Yeah. Uh, and there, there are individual yearly variations. I think um, three years ago that, that, that was, was somewhere in the region about 1200 millimetres of rain. Um, but I just say usually looking at the figures based on what I can gather so far, it's, it's somewhere in the region of uh, 800 to 950 mils yeah. over, over a 30 year period anyway. Yeah, there's no excuse for James or any of the farmers up around there to be to blame the rain. You know, that's fair enough. Um, Niall, maybe to, to bring you in, in just in terms of that area and Lakeland dairies and, and collecting milk, has it been a kind of a growth area for you or do you see more growth coming in that space, I suppose? Or just talk to us a little bit about kind of Lakeland dairies in that zone. I suppose, Jack, that that's sort of the area that wouldn't have been James, would have been a few. James would keep me right as well here. There would have been a few suppliers up that way, would have been mm. traditionally Fane Valley mm. uh, dairies and came across the Lakeland back in 2017. Yeah. And more recently, in the merger between ourselves and, and like Patrick, uh, would have brought a lot more, particularly further north of James there, as you head on into uh, Ballamoney, Coleraine, Port Rush sort of area, would, would have been ba original Bally Rasheen area. So it has all come into the Lakeland group over the last, I suppose, three and four years there, really. It wouldn't have been a traditional area for Lakeland, but it has become more and more so over the last yeah. number of years there. So oh, quite a quite a quite a quite a quite a, quite a, a dense area, as, as Aidan has said, that mm. the, the, the vein of land there up either side of the ban, uh, as you come on ahead up uh, into Balamoni and on to Cool Rain, there is quite a quite a bit of dairy in that part of the world. There is, yeah, no, definitely. And and most of it, it's fair to say, Niall is, I call it all year round, or, or autumn calving. Like. Yeah, no, it would be traditionally yeah. more so. And as I say, yeah. whilst, whilst James would probably agree with me here, it, it wouldn't be the highest area for rainfall. It, you are further north, and obviously, mm. you know, the soil temperatures are a bit, Bit close, bit bit slower to warm up and all uh, yeah. that there. So, so yeah, I know. Bit yeah. Further on that side of things. yeah, exactly. No, it, it is like I mean, I'd say if you draw a line, like you're 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 cutting across into Belly Buffet in, Don in Donegal, you know, if you draw a line straight across, uh, the absolutely, country, so yeah. yeah, yeah, you're you're yeah. well up there, like yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, um, okay, um, listen, I, I I just want to play a clip uh, right now. Uh, Peter, our own Peter McCann was out with James um, in the shed, I suppose, looking at the cows on Friday, and we just want to play a clip now in just in terms of what they had a bit they had a bit of a chat about what was happening and what was going to happen over the next couple of weeks so we might just play that now and listen to what they had to say hey folks i'm peter mccann Norton correspondent with the farmer's journal i'm with james king here in the cubicle house uh team so it's the friday the 5th of march what are things like outside hey everything's still at the minute are we getting close to getting the cows out the grass we have uh, your good grass covers and the grain conditions are, are pretty good. So we'll just leave that there. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, out of the night, you have to put out 40 or potential. What was the kind of criteria to, to get them? Well, yeah. what we were looking at was anything to do in less than 30 litres, um, the scan back calves, September calves, you know, uh, that's the sort of thing. Okay, we want to take the first two or three days 
That's right. Pull up across their back and pile and they're ready to go even. Yeah. And then the rest of the herd, they'll be staying in there on the PMR and BD market. Well, that's, that's the plan. If, 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 if it turns out like last year, we started off with 32 cows and every week as the, as the grass growth improved, you pick another eight, you know. So we'll do the same this year, we'll build it up, you know, as weeks go on. So at the minute then, you've, you've walked fine a few times this spring. What's things looking like ground condition might and also grass covers? The ground conditions are good. We, I mean, we need to watch where we go. Some of the of the degrees. I think our average cover is 2,500 there the last days. And, uh, that week we can grew 15 kilos, you know, per hectare. So I mean, groups slow obviously at the early, but we have the grass there is kind of amazing. And then on the fertilizer front, what are you thinking? Hey, are you planning in the yard yet? Or? Well, we have sulfur cannon, but um, and that'll be it. We'll be starting to you know, put our other grazes on, we'll just see the time to get easy. Right. And then last thing, James, uh, on the slurry front, where are we at? Or much all the silage grain was slurry, it's not good for us to make early in February. We finished a wee bit of steep grain there last week, just to put it on earlier. So Various all the other side of the yeah. And then is there any of that to go on the grazing block at any point? No, we don't. We don't. All our P's and K's are 3 plus. Oh, okay. We're not using any square of the grazing grazing. Okay. So it's just, it's just going to be nitrogen on the grazing grazing. It's just nitrogen. Yeah. Yeah. That's grand James. Uh, happy grazing and hope all goes well. Peter, uh, just maybe to come to you on the back of that short little clip. I mean, it, it seems to me that, uh, and, and talking to other farmers up in Northern Ireland, like, I mean, like February, the last two weeks of February and the first week in March has been good weather conditions. Ground conditions are much to improve. But j just talk to me, is there much stock out around yet? Uh, there probably isn't much stock out, Jack. The odd uh, batch of cows out by day. But um, certainly ground conditions have improved significantly this last, you say, 10 days or fortnight. Um, a lot of slurry is, is out. A lot, of, a lot of farmers are finished up actually with slurry, have, have silage ground finished. And even then over the weekend on, on heavier parts, there was a slurry shifting and fertilizer was starting to go out. So it's been so far after such a wet winter, it's remarkable how things have improved. Mm. And Peter, you went out to the field with, with James. We'll talk to James obviously in a, in a minute, but I mean, ground conditions for you were good, were they, you know, in terms of kind of the, the couple of fields that you walked into this week, where there, especially where there is grass? Yeah, we, so we, we walked really a couple of fields just closest to the, to the parlour where mm -hmm. there'll be the contenders for cows going out first. Um, yeah. Definitely covers, there's good covers on them too. And James's grass wedge there, I, I can't remember top of my head, the average farm cover, but yeah. three quarters of the, of the bars are over 2,500 and there's a few over 3,000. So there's definitely grass there and the ground conditions have improved this last week. So it's kind of game on now for the batch of cows that are ready to go out. Yeah, nice one. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it is game on. Um, Aidan, coming to you, I mean, this, this slide represents, I suppose, a kind of a visual description. It's nice to kind of get an overview, a helicopter view of James King's farm. I mean, just, just talk us through what we're looking at here. Well, basically, basically, what you're looking at, Jack, here is a copy of James's farm map. Um, uh, the individual fields are highlighted on the map there. The yard is also highlighted there by an arrow, just to show that it's fairly centrally located uh, in relation to where cows can graze. Uh, the grey areas there are areas that are basically allocated for uh, silage primarily, but the green areas that you're looking at are make up the grazing block on James's farm. Okay, and and James, it's fair to say that like there's a, there's a road splitting. We'll say the green and the grey there, isn't there? I mean, in terms of like you'd have to cross a road to get a, to get a, to get cows across the road. We'll say to to get into that grey area. That, that's correct. Yeah, the um, all the grazing ground um, is on our own ground more or less, and that's all all uh, all we have. A, we have a lane right down through that. We're, we're grazing every field off a lane there. Um, so far, that has been enough of an area for grazing. Yeah, I mean, it's it's quite a long farm, I'll say. If you just if you're just if we're just look at the gray the green area, sorry, it's 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 very long, you know. I mean, and and there's there's like there's no real, you know, there's 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 uh, there's there's elbows and there's corners and there's you know, it's not it's not one big square field anyway. That's for sure. No, that's that's for sure. I suppose it's very traditional in the area. You know, the fields are quite small. They actually suit the number of cows we have pretty well. You know, most of those fields we would we, we just use a 
strip grazing system on them, you know, and, and they maybe graze sort of two or three grazings out of each field, you know, that type of way. Yeah. Um, as, as I say, it's very typical in our area. Yeah. Small blocks of land and you're... Yeah, you're, they're you're, they're spread out all over the place, really. Correct. Yeah, yeah. No, don't send them with the rainfall. You can't blame the rainfall. Um, here's here's no. some of the here's some of the here's some of the stock that you that you that you that you purchased. Um, uh, Aiden, you you you've done up a slide here just in terms of some of the stats on these on these sure. heifers. Like, um, just maybe talk us through some of these. Uh, um, talk through some of the numbers that you have on this on this on this slide. Sure, yes. Well, you're looking at a photo of one of the cows that uh, James purchased last year. Uh, and at the outset, what we tried to do was give James a bit of guidance on how they could get best value for money out of this uh, project by giving a few guidelines in terms of overall genetic information uh, to be looking for when he was sourcing animals. And this is a summary of what information James has been able to gather up from uh, what, what he could basically could gather up last year uh, mm. on, when he was going around the various farms. Mm. in terms of EBI and associated indices. You can see overall average EBI of the cows that we could get information on was plus 156 euro with an associated subfertility index of plus 60 euro. Uh, we were looking for moderately yielding cows with positive uh, uh, milk components. Uh, you can see that's, that's what's happening there. And the overall milk solids there turned out to be on average around 16 kilos per cow. Um, those cows, they are being milk recorded the same as everything else in the herd, and you can see what the current information is for those cows. Uh, they're currently averaging just under 27 kilos per cow per day with an associated milk solid yield of 2.4 kilos per cow per day. Yeah, okay. And James, you, you mentioned at the top of the program like that, I mean, you're, you're looking for that kind, a kind of a square or a cow. I mean, were, were you, were, in your, when you were breeding, what, did you feel the cow was getting too tall and angular? Like, was that, was that your thinking? I we we I suppose like most people in the area we had we followed you know a, a Holstein type cow and we 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 searched for milk but I think we lost fertility and we lost longevity and um, and and that really um you know we were struggling to get our cows to last as long as we really wanted. Yeah, yeah. So tell me what what are you breeding the cows to now? Uh, is it is it is it all beef sires, uh, James? It's it's all beef sires, Bells and Blue and Aberdeen Angus, yeah. Right. And how how's how in terms of calving ease and that kind of issue, how how is any any issues as a result of that? To be honest, uh not any more different from normal. Okay. You know, the our first calves were all Bells and Blue calves, and to be honest, we calved very few of them, most of them calved themselves right. and good lively calves. Believe it or not, you we we found that once we once we started onto the Angus calves, we had, we had slightly more trouble. Yeah, I think the Angus calves are actually are now are, are nearly bigger, but yeah. uh, no, the Bells and Blue calves calve very easily, and I mean they they attract a very strong premium at the minute. Now they're a great price, and and obviously it's all sire specific. I mean, when you talk about the breeds there, I mean the Angus sire that you selected was maybe a little bit harder calving. But but James, are, is it all AI that you're using still, or is there stock wolves there? No, it's all it's all AI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we have a we have a young fella calls in now and shocks the cows every day, and uh, he's doing the AI for me. Okay, very good. Um, okay, look at we might we might um, talk a little bit more about that in a future webinar. But at the moment, we're we're kind of trying to move into soil fertility and grazing. So I mean, Aidan, again, you've put together these numbers in terms of I suppose the herd performance. What's what's happening on this herd at the moment in terms of milk production? Yes, uh, well, James, as with the other dairy link project farmers, submits information in terms of feed inputs and milk production information on a monthly basis into the CAPRI margin over concentrate calculator. And these are the latest figures for James's herd um, in terms of rolling annual performance. You can see there cows on average are doing around 7,200 litres per cow per year from around 2.35 tonnes of concentrate per cow. And milk solid yield in this case is in around 546 kilos per cow. And the margin over concentrate for the herd currently stands just below uh, 1,400 pounds per cow. Okay, and this is this is kind of autumn calving, starting calving when and kind of finishing when. What's the kind of breakdown? Okay, James just starts starts calving down. You're starting right in or about the start of September there, James, and you finish up when, well, more or less, if you want we, to say. We start in September. I mean, our aim is to calve as many cows as we can before the end of the year. 
but uh, that's work in progress. I mean, we still have cows to calve now. We don't. Yeah. We, we, we 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 stopped in April now with no calves over the summer, but we would like to try and push those April ones forward if we could. But okay, but the bulk of the herd, James, does calve down before the end of the year. To be fair. Yeah, the bulk of them calves down before the end of the year. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, as you say, you'd like to tighten it up further, and and look at you. That's as you. That's in your control if if you call them. But at the moment, you, you're you're needing the milk from them, so you're 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 kind of holding on to them. But I mean, as you say, that's that's your choice. Um, okay. Um, so I suppose to kind of uh, to move into the kind of the soil fertility aspect of it. Um, I mean, look what we want to kind of look at. The, I'll talk to Aidan on the Dairy Link Farms, and I'll talk to on on, J, on James King's particular farm as well. But I mean, before maybe we go there, I mean, <clears throat> Niall, you do a lot of soil samples for suppliers. We'll say within Lakeland Dairies, and maybe maybe just you you you've three slides here. I think just showing some of the stats. We'll say from from the soil samples, the results of the soil samples that you that you have taken. Maybe just take us through. Um, you know the, the the numbers here on the on the particular samples that we're looking for. Yeah, no bother, uh, Jack. No, we do a soil sampling initiative each winter for our suppliers. I opened every, all each and every one of our suppliers to get samples done. Uh, we employ a few people to go out and take the samples and, and send them off for analysis. So we've been running that now for the last five or six years. I've been involved now four years in this program. So um, this year has been our biggest run yet so I just thought it'd be a good idea to share sort of what we have seen to 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 the webinar here so it gives a sort of a wider view as to what's happening uh, apart from just the six farms that's in the in the dairy link project that uh, see on the wider thing so we talk about 2300 samples there from over 200 suppliers farms over the last sort of uh, three months january or december january and february um see where it came up there. So just to, to take a quick run through the table here, I suppose, uh, of the of the samples we, we took, 37% uh, of them came back as having optimum fertility. And that was, uh, to be optimum fertility, I suppose, is a pH of six or greater, a P index of two plus or greater, and a K or potassium index of two minus or greater. So about a third of all samples came back as optimum, which was, I suppose, not too bad. Um, and But 70% of them were okay for, for pH. Now, the only proviso, and I have put it in the table there, um, on, on, the, on the table just to show for comparison purposes, um, the, the lab and, and the, the still the recommendation in Northern Ireland and across the UK is for grassland is for pH of 6. Mm. So we have, seven, say, 70% of the farm, 70% of the samples are uh, okay for that there, but the Republic of Ireland south of the border is the recommendation six point three. Jack, is that correct? That's right. That's correct. Yeah. So if, if I if I applied those parameters to the, the the samples that we took north of the border, that would pull that down to forty percent of them being optimum for pH. So depending, you know, if we're talking here about G, about James and getting out early to grass and all. Really, if we're trying to get into that sort of growing that 10, 12, uh, 14 kilos of dry matter of grass, you probably do need your pHs up at that 6.3 mark. Yeah. So I just thought it was worthwhile just to, to add that in. Yeah. Um, look at about uh, when you when you go look at the P and K, give or take, and this comes back year upon year, it's very, very similar. Um, uh, most of the most of the two thirds of the samples are coming back at the correct indices for P and K. So 68% for a P index of two plus or greater, and 65% of the samples were a K index of two minus or greater. So mm. there's, there's reasonable levels of fertility uh, out there, but you know, there's still at least two thirds of the soils need some work. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you're right. As you say, if you just take that top line, the optimum fertility, 854 samples, 37% are in optimum fertility. But that means the other two thirds are not in optimum yeah. fertility. And is it fair to say, looking at that slide, Niall, that it might be more of a lime issue than a P and K issue? You know, I mean, if you have 70, 70 65%, 70% of your, of your soils, okay for, you know, two plus or two minus for P and K respectively, like, is it is it maybe even a kind of a, a lime issue more so than a pH issue, a lime issue more well, so than P and K? Not maybe necessarily, Jack, as I say, you still your pH of six is still 71% of the samples are what we class as, as being okay. So it's just a combination, you know, because there's just, there could be a lot of samples are fine for pH, but they're low for P and K or likewise, yeah. 
you could have samples that are okay for P and, P and K or either one and oak and, and mead lime. So there's a wee bit of everything involved there. There definitely, yeah. you know, it's not one thing that you can put your put your finger on and say it's just this one thing. It is look at yeah. it's multifactorial. You have to and you have to address all issues, but there's and it's yeah. just getting down to that individual field level rather than maybe the blanket approach of we yeah. just we'll we'll just sow this fertilizer for silage and and let the fields that are lacking let them worry about themselves. That's you know you're never going to improve it. You keep going that way. No. And Niall, is it fair to say these are across the farms? As in those grazing blocks, there's silage ground, there's yeah. heifer ground. Everything is in everything. Here. Everything. So as I say, some some folk would sample all their all their. I think the biggest uh, the biggest one we done was maybe sixty or seventy samples back down to maybe two or three samples on other farms. So some people do a number of samples each year, and some people would sample all their land maybe once every three years or once every yeah. three years or whatever it is. I mean, I think one of the big lessons of Dairy Link in phase one and, and into phase two now, Niall, has been that, you know, I mean, effectively we're soil sampling every year. The farmers that are in it are getting soil sampled every year and that's allowing us to build a kind of a, a real picture for the farm in terms of what's happening or not happening. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Your next slide here is on the, is, a, is, is just a county breakdown on the P index, two on plus the, or above. Yeah, and I suppose just to show, to, to show really... On the on the phosphorus side of things, there doesn't seem to be very much variation across a uh, across counties. Um, as I said, I think the figure there was sixty eight percent was the average of P index of two plus or greater. Mm. Um, so there's no there's nowhere really there. Fermanagh looks like an outlier a wee bit, but there was very few samples I suppose taken in Fermanagh. So okay, that's maybe why it shows that there. But you know they are all round or about that. About two thirds of the signs are fine for. Mm. For P, in fact, maybe you could say they're fine. There's probably a lot of cases that are actually, whilst whilst it's two plus or higher, we are seeing quite a few samples threes and threes and fours, you know, as well. So it's reasonably well covered for for phosphorus now. For no phosphorus, that there. And I look at it. Yes, that comes from uh, over the last twenty years, particularly in Northern Ireland. There has been a, a more of a focus on producing more milk, and there's obviously more meal being fed. So it's yeah. not a pea being imported onto farms in, in the form of meal, you know. The form of meal, correct. That's how it's getting out there and, and, and being returned into the farmland, as you say. Here's K. Here's K. Yeah. yeah. So so K is it? I'm I'm finding, and I've found this over the last uh, four years. To say there, there, there is a variation within counties, and I suppose that's where maybe it's just to to give people out there that are watching this webinar tonight. Um, just to give it a feel if maybe if they haven't got soil sampling done on their own farms. But as I say, the average across the six counties was 65%. But there's a big range there, as we can see, like Antrim, and we'll probably see it in James's results later on. They're very representative of this as well. You know, 80% of the samples in Antrim showed up as being fine for, pay, for K, whereas if you go to Tyrone, it's only 45%. So there seems to be a variation. Uh, Derry as well, Peter's mm. part of the world there. 50% of the soils are deficient in K, you know, requiring K. So I think it's a very important message to get out there yeah. uh, that, uh, that that there is, particularly there is potassium needed on a lot of farms. Uh, and particularly the pr problem seems to be more West. Well, that's the fragmented nature of farms. Maybe it's not getting, yeah. you know, the further, generally the further away from the yard you get, the worse yeah. the, the potash indexes <clears throat> tend to get. Maybe it's, you know, Possibly heavier cuts of silage, maybe that's right. The Tyrone farms are getting maybe some of the money you're getting two and three cuts, whereas you go into Antrim and Down, they're getting their three and four cuts. Maybe it's just not as severe. Yeah. They're maybe a bit earlier. So it's it's hard to say what it is. Maybe it's just the soil, maybe the soil's not holding, maybe maybe the K is leaching out of it, mm. you know, with the higher rainfall in those areas. But it's just interesting. I just thought it was an interesting point to put out. And it's it not is. just I say it's not just 2021. This trend has been evident since we have started to analyze these results on a county by county basis over the last three or four years. No, you're right. I mean, it is. It is the the, the east west divide is, is is particularly good there, um, um, Niall, in terms of showing this issue. And and of course, if you if you're to look at it, I mean, we'll say P is kind of I call it the the, the expensive one in terms of 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 fixing. And like they're, they're not bad. If you look at these results in terms of P results, as you say, a lot of the farms are okay, yeah. but. PH and K can be fixed relatively yeah. easy by farmers if they know, if they have actually results to go on, it's fair yeah. to say, Niall. No, definitely so. There's no doubt about it. And, you know, that's what we have uh, focused a lot there whenever we're sending out results on it would be to give recommendations for, particularly for silage ground, 
mm-hmm. um, to to don't be afraid to add the, the the K in if it needs it, you know. And I suppose look at for anybody who's watching this tonight, maybe and they haven't got sale results done, maybe it's something if they're thinking about sowing fertilizer over the next couple of weeks, you know, particularly if you're in those areas and you're not getting the slurry, you know the slurry's not going on as maybe as as often or as as heavy as it should be on sale is going to make sure and put the potash back into the soil yeah yeah no i think i think so and i mean the recommendation we do, we talked about it last week on farm tech talk the recommendation is 100 units of nitrogen 20 units of p and 100 units again of k you know so that i mean that's that's the rule so if you're taking a good first cut like i mean that's that's what you need to be getting on that's, you need to be fertilizing now yeah. that for for first cut silage as you yeah. say Niall. like yeah absolutely yeah. and um, there's, there's plenty of good products out there zero p and and hey k so you know, yeah, as you say they're not the most they're not the most ex- like potash isn't the most expensive fertilizer. No, and there's no restrictions on it no. really either. You know, the the pea restrictions on a lot of farms, you know, because and rightly so, because you don't want to be putting on too much and yeah. you need to make it efficient and you don't want to lose it yeah. to the environment. So and, um and just going back on your point there, uh, Jack, mm-hmm. in terms of the first phase of the dairy link, I was speaking to one of the farmers back that done a bit of sampling, and he has been using straight potash in the in the back end of the year this last three or four yeah. years since he joined the dairy link project right. that time at the start, yeah. and he says it really. He says you're really, really seeing the benefits of it now. It did take that three, four years for it to build up in the soil, but that's really coming to fruition now. He goes on every year by the end of September with a bag of potash zero zero fifty. Yeah. On 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 ground that needs it exactly yeah and that he's getting a return from and you're Absolutely. right I mean yeah. and it's a, but is it your point there in terms of it's a long term burner you're not going to maybe see it year one and year two as no. would you really see it once you start once you once you build up that capacity in the in the soil that you really you can really see it then early in the season as well yeah. as late in the season like yeah yeah, yeah. no um, so. No, nice one, Niall. I think very, very interesting to, to kind of see those results. As you say, they're they're they're, they're the Lakeland initiative for, for winter 2021, but but also they're see, they're they are what you're seeing for the last number of years. This isn't yeah. just a kind of a once-off phenomenon. Very, 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 very steady in terms of the percentages there each year. Um Niall, just to finish up on this slot, I mean, is it is it fair to say that is there is there enough of guys? Do you reckon is there enough of suppliers taking samples? Like, I mean, I, I you see that you saw, we saw the first slide. I think you said two hundred suppliers. You know, yeah. uh, you know, two thousand three hundred uh, samples. I mean, is there is there enough of people? Is there enough of interest in soil sampling? Ah, uh, it's it's growing, Jack. It is growing. You know, there's a, a number of factors. I suppose this last couple of years. He hadn't made a better figures on it than me, but even over the last number of years, there's been more farmers north of the border have opted for derogation. Mm. And uh, they're sort of this, this the, the soil sampling has been, you know, obviously part of that, that they have to do it. But there's certainly a lot of farmers out there are seeing the benefits of it. You know, they're, they are seeing it. But with 200 done this winter, we've done 160, 170 the winter before. So I'd say over the last three or four years, we have sampled sort of around the, Four to five hundred farms, which is kind of coming near forty percent of of our suppliers have sampled in the last number of years, and that's only us doing it. Like you've got the fertilizer companies doing it, you've got Caffrey are doing soil mm. soil analysis, so there is quite scope. But there's probably still your cohort of twenty five to thirty percent of boys that never do it, and maybe never will. I don't know. Yeah, I know. All we can do is is, is get the message out again, Niall. I think yeah. you're right, and, and little initiatives like you do there in Lakeland, I think is I think are very important and very worthwhile because otherwise, I mean, guys are peddling in the dark really yeah. without, no, without having the, the soil analysis results. Yeah. So, um, perfect. I mean, Aidan, just looking at the slide we have in front of us now, I mean, these are these are James James's results, you know, for his farm on average. So average that's pH, right. average P, average K. Yes, that's right, Jack. Uh, yeah, look, the the following couple of slides probably just reinforce the points that Nell has been making there. You can see these are average results for the soil samples that James took this winter, uh, with an average pH across the farm uh, at that stage of 6.3, uh, P index of three, and K index on average of four across the field samples, uh, which indicate that there's little or no need uh, for any inorganic uh, uh, K and certainly no need for any inorganic P to be applied after manures are accounted for. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, so as you say, there's no need for bag P, there's no need for bag K because of the feed that James is, he's feeding two and a half, three ton of meal per cow. So that's been recycled from the, from the, from the meal into the slurry back out onto the ground and the grazing, of course, itself as well is returning um, organic matter and all the nutrients to, to the, to the, isn't that it, Aiden? Isn't that why? Yes, the, the, the combination of factors, that certainly will be a contributory factor. The soil types around that area, from what, from what I remember, are 
fairly rich in potassium anyway, which also help the matter. But yes, there's going to be a nutrient recycling is, is bound to be a contributory factor in this situation, Jack. Yeah. Um, so dig a little bit deeper. Here we are. Here we are now at kind of um, at a level. This is pH now showing James's farm. The map that we saw earlier showing the different grades, the different colors. Talk to us through. Yes. Well. Um, what what we've done or what one of uh, the the Caffrey environmental advisors on the Tuesday has done in this situation is to superimpose the information that we've got from James's soil analysis results onto the actual farm map. So there are a series of color codes here to illustrate what's going on in terms of the distribution of soil pH and soil nutrients across the farm. Uh, James is still in the process of collecting soil samples throughout the project. So some of the areas haven't been tested yet, and they're they're colored in gray here. But perhaps we'll focus on the other areas, just in this situation where you can see some areas are hi highlighted in green, uh, gold or red. Uh, in this situation, those areas highlight the, the pH of the soil on those individual fields. So fields that are highlighted in green here have a pH of greater than 6.2. Uh, fields uh, that are highlighted in yellow or gold uh, have a, been identified to have a pH between uh, 5.9 and 6.1. And uh, fields that are highlighted in red have a pH of less than 5.8. Uh, now, most of the fields that you're looking at here uh, belong to the grazing block, if you remember back to the map that you saw earlier on in the presentation. Uh, but uh, interesting enough, we started to sample some of the, the fields that have been allocated for cotton. And uh, interesting enough, they, they've turned up with a slightly lower pH. Those, those fields at the very top of the map there, highlighted in red, were allocated for cotton and they, they have a pH of 5.7. So it's something we'll need to focus on in the, the short to longer term. I mean, we, we could, you could solve this, you know, now if you wanted to, um, Aidan, in terms of like just getting your lime out. Like, I mean, there's, there's timing. Okay, yep. you, have, you have to be careful, like, you know what I mean? But timing isn't important. Timing isn't important in terms of the knock on consequences. Like, I mean, you could, if the weather was right and there wasn't too much of a cover of grass, you know, um, you could get out onto those red paddocks with two ton, three ton of lime to the acre just to get it to get it started anyway, to get started fixing that problem. It's certainly worth considering, Jack, uh, but it also needs to be borne in mind that you need to also take on board uh, what you've actually done in terms of uh, your nutrient management plan and implementing that. Uh, if their organic manures have been applied on there, that could restrict when uh, you, you may have to delay any applications of uh, lime that you may want to apply for, until later on in the season. Uh, but certainly, yes, it, it's there's no it's it's an option worth considering if the conditions allow. Mm. James, is there any particular reason do you think why the kind of I call it the top half of the farm of your top half of your grazing block is there any reason why that's yellow and red as opposed to green, kind of like the lower half, like any any soil type issue or anything? No. Well, there's no there's no real difference in the soil type. Mm. The red fields at the top there are a neighbour's. That's yeah. that's conacre ground and that. I mean, that's something I would need to discuss with him, really, about yeah. putting, putting the lime on it. The field at the bottom, interestingly, is our top cover at the minute. And my intention with that is to, uh, that, that's where I want to graze the cows first. And then once that's grazed, I'm going to get lime on that one there now. Just The funny thing about that, that field always has heavy covers, but they never, to me, they never graze the bottom of it out. Never seen it out. Yeah, interesting. Like, yeah, yeah. I think as interesting, you know. Yeah, it is. Yeah, no, a nice one. I mean, but your your first comment, even on the Conacre, James. I mean, that's that's a problem. You know, it's, it's not just your problem. It's the same across across Northern Ireland and, and the South as well. You know that if you're if you can't invest in the soil, you're not getting as good a return for it as you can, and you're not making best use of the nutrients. You know, so it's that you put on. If you put on bag nitrogen or phosphorus or whatever, you're not getting good. You know, unless the pH is right. Like, I mean, it's a, it's a pity not to be able to make it make a land work for you. So. So interesting comments, um, definitely, and and good. As you say, you're going to try and fix that bottom red paddock. You're going to try and fix that sooner rather than later. And and your yeah. comment again on the sweetness of the grass is, is is interesting as well because the cows are the first one to tell you, like, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah, we don't need Nile soil sampling at all. Like, you know what I mean? We just talk to the cows. Um, here's here's the phosphorus. Uh, Aiden, talk to us on the phosphorus here. You have, you have a couple of color 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 called the blue here now. Yeah. Yes, uh, similar approach to what was done with uh, the previous slide there, Jack. Except we we'll use a different color coding scheme here. Where basically uh, fields that are highlighted in that dark blue have been identified to have a pH or sorry soil P index greater than three, uh, and the lighter colored uh, fields there. Uh, but light shear blues are, are P index of two plus. Uh, 
And of the fields that are sampled there, you can see in James's case, all the fields that have been sampled so far have a P index of two plus or greater. Yeah. So like, I mean, like, like looking at this, like you would say again, the same thing, like P, P, P is not a problem. P, P doesn't need yeah. to be spread here because Correct. of the, the, the soil status that's there. Like, yeah. <clears throat> There are, James's situation is perhaps maybe jacked slightly different to some of the farms that we have in the project in that we have identified some fields that are have a low P index and we're taking steps to address that in the nutrient management plan. But in James's case, um, James is going out there applying straight nitrogen. And from what we can see, the, the, the soil analysis results, there's no re reason to change that strategy at this point in time. Yeah. Now, I mean, we have to caveat again, we're looking at the grazing block here, which on a lot of farms is the better soil samples like, you know, and, and usually the out farms, you know, where you're pulling silage off, as, as Niall said earlier, you're pulling a lot of pot potassium out of the soil. So, I mean, that, that, I think we need to caveat that, like that we are looking at James's. James, again, the four paddocks on the top, they're, they're, they're the Conacre um, con paddocks again. And you have one paddock down here in the bottom that looks a little bit of an out, that, that square field down the bottom. <laughs> Well, the, the one at the bottom is what we would, we call it Blaney's Meadow. It's one of those, it would be slightly poor type land now. Okay. But uh, the, the ones at the top again, now that, that last year that was cut four times and it was, that was slurried every time. So as far as putting mm. slurry on, I don't think we can do much more with that now. Mm. Now, the only thing I'll say, James, maybe is if, if let's say the cows are on the silage at night, uh, at, during the winter, that's coming from those paddocks that are low and it, you know, it, you, if, if you're recycling poor slurry back onto them, um, it might still fix the problem. You see, that, that might be the challenge. And, and, and we don't know where your silage is coming from. You know, it might be coming from low P and K silage. So you, you're, you mightn't be great silage in terms of that either. You know, that's, that, that's why it mightn't be enough just to fix that problem. I hear you in terms of, as you say, you did your best to get the slurry out on, on those after silage cuts. But um, if, the, if, it's not, if the power isn't in the slurry, it won't, it won't fix them either. Yeah. Um, Okay, no, good, good, good points. Um, Aidan, I'm moving on to the potassium, onto the soil K. Yes, uh, a picture here for soil K and the distribution of soil K across the farm, similar to what was outlined in the previous slide there. You can see the darker fields uh, on the map, which takes up most of the grazing block, have been identified to have a, a K index greater than three. Um, so um, in this situation, no need really for any additional uh, inorganic potash to be applied either. Mm. And James, that, that field that's a little bit lighter pink, like, I mean, that looks a good square field to be ideal for cutting. Is it, is it, more, is it cut more often than not, or is it a, graz a grazing field? No, it's a grazing field. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, any reason why it might be slightly low in K that, you, that you're aware of, like, no? Not, that, not, not really, not that I can yeah. think of, no, to be honest. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So look at, I mean, it's a nice way of looking at it, I think, Aidan, isn't it, in terms of the colour coding and just for, sure. for a farmer or for a contractor or for anyone that's working with the farm to kind of be able to give them something like this. Um, I think, I think it's, a, it's a nice little tool. It's a kind of, I call it a bog basic tool. It's just something in terms of visually, it's very, it's very easy to kind of understand and see and to see. It's very descriptive. Absolutely, Jack. I think look, the, the, it's an exercise we carried out with the farmers for the first time this year, and I think they've certainly appreciated it because, as you've highlighted, it, it, it allows the farmers to focus on areas that need attention very quickly and very easily. Yeah, no, it, it, it does. And in, in phase one, we'd, we'd, we'd done it previously, and I, I, and I think it, 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 has, it has worked well. Um, okay, let's, let's, let's move on from the soil sampling into a little bit of kind of, I suppose, this, this, this crop nutrient report. Aidan, maybe just like there's a lot of figures and numbers on this yeah. on this slide, but maybe just maybe take us through some of the kind of key areas that we'll say that need to be highlighted, we'll say, from, from when you're looking at it. Yeah. OK, well, Jack, yes, as I mentioned earlier, um, each farm has a nutrient management plan prepared for it. And um, those farms located in Northern Ireland have their plans prepared using the DARA online nutrient management calculators. And um, this is a copy of the report for one field from one of those farms prepared using the program. Uh, the areas highlighted here indicate that we're using information from the farm in terms of soil analysis results and what nutrients they're applying on the farm. Uh, you can see at the top of the page there, P index in this particular field was 2 plus and K index was 1. Uh, the farmer uh, was applying slurry around 3,000 gallons to the acre of slurry, which you can see at the bottom of the page, and around another three bags to the acre of uh, an inorganic fertilizer called 23010. Uh, the field in this question here was being prepared for first cut silage. Um, the program 
then calculates the requirements uh, for that crop in terms of N, P and K, uh, which you can see in the middle of the page. And it also works out how much of those nutrients are being supplied through the application of slurry and a fertilizer. The uh, main thing to take out of this, I would say, is look, looking at a field there that has a P index of 2 plus, that the application of around 3,000 gallons of slurry will more or less meet the phosphate requirements for that crop with any, without any need for any an additional inorganic P. Uh, likewise, if you look at the potash requirements of the crop, applying that amount of slurry, uh, even with an index of 1, is meeting around two thirds of the potash requirements for the crop. So there's only a small need for additional inorganic uh, potash on top of that. Okay, so I mean, I mean, and, and Aidan, your advice is that, I mean, if, if there's, if there's, you know, I mean, if you're, if, if you're like, you're uh, stopping silage and, 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 and kind of planning a crop, like it's, it, there's more, it's important to get it right because you're spending a lot of money on this, on this particular crop. So it's important to kind of, I suppose, create some kind of a plan in terms of what you need to get on it. And, and maybe I suppose what the, what the slurry can bring to the party as well. Absolutely. Look, Jack, look, the, the, one, the main reason for getting the farmers to, to do this exercise across the farm is to get an appreciation of whether all the fields are the same at the end of the day. Uh, if they're not, then we're, we're producing a plan to help address the imbalances that may exist on the farm. Um, it also highlights the importance of what organic manure can provide uh, in terms of nutrient supply. Uh, as you can see there, uh, in that situation, uh, applying 3,000 gallons to the acre was more or less meeting the phosphate uh, requirements of the crop. Um, and it, it ties in again with what Niall was saying earlier on. Uh, what we're also finding in, in a lot of the cases that um, fields that are located that bit further away from, from the farmyard are lower in, in potash. So what we're trying to redirect the farmers to do is to send more slurry out to those fields yeah. uh, rather than maybe select fields which are more conveniently located towards the yard. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, no, no, perfect. Um, thanks for that, Aidan. Um, I just want to—I want to play a clip here now of 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 Peter and uh, James. They were in the field again. They did a bit of recording on on Friday last. So I think I I I I think we I think we just get a get a feel for what they had a chat about and get a feel for, as you said, some of the covers and we can see again some footage of 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 uh, the grassland and what it's looking like at the moment. So let's just have a have a play of this clip with uh, James and Peter. Right, James, we're just we're in a paddock here, uh, quite close to the yard. There's a nice cover on this. Or you walked this the other day and wanted to come up at? Uh, that's was that's was twenty five hundred there on Monday. Right, Monday past. So when was the last time this was really grazed? Did you? Uh, that would have been sort of the tail end of October. I buy milk and cows. Oh, like, I the milk yeah. and cows. I. So uh, you said earlier there in previous years when when you had uh, you kept some replacements of your own, you would have had them out. You know. Right after when the cows were been housed Whenever back the cows in. were housed, we tried to keep our heifers out as long as possible to save silage and they were grazed and grazed this down into the quick and we wouldn't have this level of grass in the springtime at all, you know. Yeah, so and this is fairly standard across the farm. I looked at the at the grass wedge there, like three quarters of the, the paddocks are probably over twenty five hundred, but only a yeah. few on down like or, yeah. so you have a nice cover and you have a couple over three thousand to see as well. Right. So that they're ready for cows. So yeah. That's spot on, James. Good man, thanks. Eh? <laughs> James, uh, just to comfort, so just just nice to get a feel for, as you say, yourself and Peter are in the field, and like there looks to be decent covers of of, of grass there. I am um, James. I was I was hoping to see cows in the background. I didn't see them. But tell tell me they're there today, are they? <laughs> Sorry, Jack. I have to let you down again. <laughs> <laughs> no, as I say, I was we were chatting earlier. Uh, the spring has come quicker than we realised again, and with a wee bit of work to do in a laneway and uh, a few hedges just to finish up so we're, we're ready for grazing now I would say the cows could probably be about with we'll sort of uh, Aidan and me we did select 40 cows lower yielding cows that were back in calf uh, to start the grazing and I would think they, they could be out this week now. Okay so as you say that's the plan they're in there they're on the lane they're on the way down I mean to tidy up a few bits and pieces and get them out I mean Again, we heard from earlier from your clip with, with Peter in the shed. I mean, you have selected those those cows that you know, as you I think you described them as bomb proof that they're 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 effectively they're in calf. They're producing less than thirty liters. Um, it, you, that's that's what you're selecting for a start, like to to get a kind of a, a number of cows out. Well, we find that that's that's the type of cow 
you can get out early if the weather goes against them it doesn't seem to do them any harm you know they're they're in good flesh they're back in calf they're settled and they can they can work way a wee bit of you know in and out if that if that would happen you know so mm. Uh, it worked really well last year. We started with that number of cows. Um, well, last spring was a very good spring, and, and we, we we increased it that quite quickly. You know, the more cows every week. So uh, our intention is to do that again this year, and as the growth improves, you know, hopefully get them all out pretty sharp. Okay, Aidan, you have a couple of comments here on kind of on, on the benefits of early turnout and getting you know putting it into guys' minds that you you know now is it, ground conditions are good. And you know, there's a bit of grass out there that has been planned from the autumn. Well, it's you know, it's time to it's time to start utilizing it now. Yes, the, the, you know, it, it can be challenging this time of year to get cows out, but conditions are good, so people should be thinking about looking at the opportunity of, of getting those cows out. Uh, there are benefits associated with that. Uh, there's research to show that uh, you know, getting cows out that bit area, even for a few hours per day, will improve uh, both milk yield and the production of milk solids. Um, James has also found even that aside that it, it also helps his, his own situation and that uh, it helps him to get a handle on the covers being grazed that bit earlier. So it makes grazing that bit easier in April and May. I don't know if there's anything you want to say about that, James. No, that's true. We did find last year we, we got our wage established early, you know, and our, our grass was at different levels and that really was a benefit. And then throughout the year that sort of looked after itself, but it's important to get that established early. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I mean, that's one of the keys, like, and it, because I mean, you know, if, if like traditionally we'd have all waited until Paddy's day and afterwards, like, you know, we'll say to kind of to make a to make a call and the next thing you're going out into this farm that has a wall of grass and you're you're picking your way through it and getting into heavier covers. I mean, if you get out that little bit earlier, even if it's slightly lower cover, you don't have the grass on the farm, but, but at least you can make a start and create that wedge. So you found that benefit, James, big time in terms of, as you say, in the earlier last year, tell me what, what day was it last year when you started getting out? Last year it was it was mid March now, yeah. which would generally be quite early for mm. for around here. But as I say, it worked a treat. We had we had grass then all different covers and mm. it sort of looked after itself then the rest of the rest of the grazing season. You know? yeah. yeah, too much grass can be a problem. Uh, very much so. Like you know when you when you when you're not grazing it. Um, Aidan, anything else you want to say in terms of nutrients and getting out, getting fertilizer? I mean, have, the, have these paddocks been fertilized? I wonder that you're thinking about grazing in the next couple of days. It's on the cars there, Jack. I know we discussed this with James. We would be encouraging uh, folk to think about getting some fertilizer out there in terms of the, for the first round. Um, if you could target some of the region about 35 units of nitrogen, uh, providing the weather and ground conditions permit, obviously. And uh, yeah, we think it would be something to, uh, in order to keep the grass growing. Uh, certainly, you know, there, there's covers of grass to be grazed there at the minute, but the concern would be if, if we don't get the fertilizer on that soon, that whatever will be grazed off now will take that bit longer to come back if, it, if it's not fertilized appropriately. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, it's still, uh, you know, a lot of farmers ask that question this time of the year. You, you still should get the nitrogen out because it, look at it does, it brings it back that bit quicker and you have a product there, you have a crop there to take up the nutrients as well, you know, um, as opposed to ha having the leaf all re removed and, and not being able to take in the sunshine and then hence not grow. So get, get, the, get the, get the, James, the plan is to get a bit of nitrogen on this, like, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're ready to go. That's, that's, that's in the yard and that's ready to be sold, yeah. Come on, come on. Um, okay. Um, in terms of, I suppose, measuring grass, I mean, J James, you've talked about it already, creating the wedge and the weekly covers. Um, I, I, you know, how long did it take you to get in on this this piece of work, like in terms of walking the farm, like the photograph shows us, you know, and, and getting out there and doing a kind of a, a weekly cover? How, how, you know, how long did it take you to kind of get up, get up to speed on it? Uh, you mean since we started the project? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a wee bit... Around this area, people sort of look at it and look at you walking through the fields and think you're sort of nuts, you know. Yeah. But uh, every time you do it, you see something that needs to sort it, and, and it's the only way I really know. And I think it really backs up what you sort of feel in your head. You know, it puts a measurement to it. I mean, you can be discussing with your son or your father, have we enough grass? I think we have enough grass. But whenever you actually measure it, it gives you that more of a confidence in the, in the fact that you have enough grass for your cows, yeah. you know, for whatever period of time. Yeah. 
No, you're you're dead right. Like I mean, and believe me, James, they they all thought we were nuts down around here as well. John Curtis, Lord rest him, uh, used you say that he was doing it at night time with a flash lamp so that, <laughs> lads, so that lads wouldn't see him doing it. But I mean, he soon got out of that. Um, and and look at he, but I mean, look at it. It is important to get out and just as you say. And, and get a feel for the farm. And, you know, even if you're, if, if you're like, you, you, some people are, get worried about accuracy and that you're, they're 100 or 200 kilos off, but it really makes no difference because you're just seeing what's happening to the farm. You're getting a feel for the farm. And, um, you know, it, it, it gives you a good feel for some of the jobs that need to be done, like sowing fertilizer or getting cows out or stopping this for silage, et cetera, and that kind of thing. Um, Aidan, is there enough of farmers across Northern Ireland measuring grass? Uh, the short answer would be no, uh, Jack. It's only a very small proportion of, of farmers uh, measuring grass, but I have to say that anybody that I've come across that has actually taken it up uh, has found it to be a good exercise and have continued to do so. Yeah. Um, um, and just tell me the, the software that we're using here. I see James has a plate meter, but it's, it's one of those fancy plate meters. I see that it, it, it's counting, it's, um, it's counting, um, it's counting stuff for us. And, and we punch that into, we're using, what, what, what software are we using? Yes, the, the data that James is using is uh, AgriNut grass budgeting software, uh, which he inputs on a weekly basis. Uh, that uh, generates a range of information, depending on what information you put in there. But uh, the, the information, the data we're primarily focusing on at this stage would be the grass wedge that it produces. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it also produces some uh, uh, information just on the uh, general covers, average covers, as you can see on the slide here. Uh, last measurement showed that the average cover for the farm was around 2,500 kilograms of diameter per hectare. And because James had been measuring for at least two weeks in a row, it was also able to calculate a growth rate, uh, which you can see in this situation was averaging around 16 kilograms of drying water yeah, per hectare is, per day. Which is quite good, you know, for the time. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was more than we thought. Now, there were individual fields, I have to say, that yeah. the growth rates were not much in that. And, um, <laughs> the fields that were, the covers were poor, uh, yeah. had very low growth rates, but certainly, uh, the fields that had heavier covers seem to be growing well, and I suppose it just added that adage of, you know, grass grows grass. Yeah, correct. And and I come to Niall McCarran in a minute, but I mean, just for just for uh, like for those viewers that are that are uh, measuring and available, that's two two and a half thousand. That's a thousand in in kind of all money or above above four centimeters. So I, an average farm cover of a thousand at this time of the year is is quite good. And I mean, and it comes back to what. Um, uh, Peter McCann said earlier in the show, like that, you know, there's, there's three quarters of the paddocks that have over a thousand or over, uh, you know, that's that's kind of nearly almost kind of entry gra entry grazing level at this time of the year. If you got if you have twelve hundred, you're you're good to go with get, to get cows in. Um, Niall, in terms of lakelands, and I suppose you know, getting um, do you, first of all, two questions. One in terms of do you see any noticeable change in kind of I suppose um, in milk quality? We'll say when cows start going out to grass, etc., and that kind of thing. And and two. Um, Again, you, you probably have more suppliers south of the border, we'll say, that are getting out that little bit earlier and it's getting and, and it's later then before it kind of gets up to kind of James King country. Yeah, I suppose the, the first one, you, obviously a lot of folk would say it and we would say it coming through, is obviously is the, the protein. The protein will take a, a fair wee jump now when cows get out the grass, particularly those cows that are that are autumn calving, um, been in the wind, been basically been housed since calving. I uh, look at the, they get out the grass. Obviously, it's, a, it's sweeter. Uh, it's a bit, the, the intake goes up for a few days. You get and, and the energy in the grass is very good this time of the year. The I suppose the, the downside you would hear, and it's going back to what James has said here, but the wedge. A lot of folk would come to me and say. Uh, it's all right getting cows out the grass. They go up on their milk and they go up on their protein for a week or 10 days and then they fall off again. And the problem is the cows aren't going out the grass to middle of April then, and maybe end of April. And mm. by the time that 10, 12 days comes around, they're grazing too high, heavy of covers oh. uh, and the quality's gone out of it. So it's a self-made problem and it's just getting the confidence, as James is talking about there, about getting out early, getting them graze, getting this, getting the grazing cycle started, getting that wedge started that you're, hitting the quality each time that you're not going into covers of over 3,000 or, uh, you know, in, in, in South of Ireland terms, 1,500. Yeah. Uh, definitely your second question, uh, I, don't, I don't have much dealings with, uh, with the folk uh, south, south of the border. Uh, mm. I suppose, look at anecdotally around home, I'm, I'm North Monaghan. We would mm. say, I would say buys out with cows quicker in Emmy Vale than I would in Ochnaclay. Mm. You know, it's just a percent. Mm. It's probably 
it is it is very little difference in the in the land type or the, the or, or climate or topography yeah. or anything along those lines. It's just yeah. uh, it's just a mindset thing. But in saying that now, like there is there is folk that have cows out uh, back there. Uh, the big cows out three weeks now in the north and places too. Uh, and play, you know, up I know several round round Oma. You had it on the on the front of the journal uh, right. a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Michael McCahey over in Trillick, now he's working on the ours, but you know, it was a few round him as well. Uh, our men had cows out around that time of the year, so yeah, it's it's just getting that confidence to go ahead with it and, yeah. and go, go with it. You know, particularly and again, James has alluded to it, if you are autumn cabin, you've got a cohort of cows that are, you know, low risk. To put out the grass and get that grass wedge going. Yeah. Certainly. No. No. There's the grass wedge up on the screen now that we're that we're talking about. I mean, um, uh, I, like I mean, Peter referenced this earlier on in the program. Like you know, you can see you know all the paddocks. They would say down as far as kind of let's say paddock fourteen. Like they're they're all scoring two and a half thousand plus. Like which is which is a thousand kilos of cover available cover in in, in all in all language. So I mean, it's it's um it, there's a good bit of grass on the farm in. Yes, Jack. We uh, walked the field in the fields and said, "Yes, I have to say, pleasantly surprised by the cover of grass in some of the fields." Uh, and th this is a graphical re representation of the, those measurements. Uh, for those who may be unfamiliar, what a grass wedge looks like. Each of those green bars uh, represents the cover recorded on an individual field, where the fields with the heaviest covers are located on the left-hand side, and the ones with the lightest covers on the right-hand side. Uh, you can see their cover, the highest cover there, just over 3,000 kilograms of dry matter per hectare. And if you're not familiar what that looks like, basically, if, if you were to put your hand in, in a, that type of a sward, uh, the grass would be rising up to about the depth of your hand. Mm. Uh, the blue line uh, basically highlights the herd demand line, uh, and that's based on the 40 cows that James talked about going out to grass for a few hours a day. Uh, and consuming around six kilograms of dry matter. Ideally, what we're trying to do here is match that line up to the top of those bars. Uh, in that case, the grass being supplied meets the demand required by the herd. In this situation, the bars are slightly above the line, which would indicate that there's, there's an excess, which if left unchecked, could lead to a grass supply and uh, an excess that Niall highlighted earlier on. But it's important to bear in mind this is only based on 40 cows going out at the start. James already mentioned uh, before that the, as time goes on, he'd be bringing more cows into, this, into the grazing setup. They'd be spending longer grazing out there. The rotation length will decrease and that line and will also rise to match the bars yeah. on the wage. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it's fair to say, no, thanks for that, Aidan. It's fair to say, um, James, there's been no sheep across the farm, has there, over the winter, or when did the last of the sheep go? Like, we, we, had, a, we had a problem there at the start, I remember when you joined the programme first, there was a lot of sheep getting in, and they were, they were breaking in, was it, over the winter, and they were clearing off a lot of the, <laughs> a lot of the paddocks. Like, talk to me about what happened there. Well, to be honest, the, the change of system we've had as well, going to the play and herd, and no heifers about, has contributed to this, because... And years gone by, we would have grazed as long as we could with the cows, and then we would have grazed even farther with the heifers. Oh, man. So this is this has just showed the benefit of actually closing up back ground over the winter, you know, and it has left us now that we're ready for a good early turnout. Yeah. Uh, there was my nephew had a few sheep on there, he ran out of grass one time. <laughs> <laughs> but those are the those are the fields with the low covers and the low growth. <laughs> uh, Peter McCann, just to come to you, I mean, it is common practice across Northern Ireland. I, I, I'm not, not saying not common practice, but I mean, it is more common, more popular than you'd see down with us that people get get lamb, store lambs in for the winter or whatever to graze off or to clean out paddocks, Maria. And and effectively, like, I mean, it means that there's no grass in those paddocks till April in the majority of cases. <laughs> Yeah, it does. Store lambs and uh, also just uh, sheep farmers who come in for, for winter grazing to, to the end of January. Uh, you know, somebody swear by it, says it does a job and silage ground, takes that cover off, whatever. But uh, certainly the key thing is to, to get them off early. Um, that is one of the, like this, this phase of the project, that first winter, that was one of the things that the, the lads were told not to do, you know, or, or take the heifers off. And uh you know, a real simple, a real, real, real simple step to do, and everyone noticed that like, at this time of year in the spring. Yeah. Um, as, as Niall says, there, there was we had people in Tyrone with cows out in February, which is like unheard of, really. And it was simply because it was a good tidal weather, yeah. we can do nothing about the weather, but 
the ground conditions were good, but the grass was there. So, like, if you have this skinned off, even the ground's as hard as the middle of the road, you can't put them out if there's no grass there. So, grass there, like, yeah, no. So, the opportunity is there, like, um, it's I mean, important to bear in mind, Jack, those, those fields with the little covers that James was highlight, highlighting there, the, the sheep had been off for about six or seven weeks, and this covers were still low. So, you know, yeah. it, it, it's important to bear that in mind. Yeah, no, it, it takes it takes it takes time. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, but look at it, as you say, there's 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 there is pl- that we've established there's plenty of grass on the farm. I mean, they, we we Peter referenced this in in, in his chat with James Aiden just and Niall mentioned it as well. Like, I mean, that, like there's there, on a lot of autumn calving cows, there is there is cows there that are bulletproof at this time of the year, no matter what like kind of weather comes at them or what type of feed type, a change in feed type, etc., and that kind of thing. Like, um, you have a couple of points on this on this slide. Yes, well, I will basically, I would, we went through James' milk records and, and what that he had on cows that were in calf because he's getting cows scanned on a regular basis there to select a group of cows that they felt confident enough that would be able to cope with the changing conditions. Um, I suppose it's fair to say there's a perception that uh, if cows are put out to grass in that part of the world that the production is going to drop. So. Uh, James wanted to focus on these bulletproof type cows where that wouldn't be the case. Uh, so that's why we selected these mid to late lactation cows doing less than 30 litres a day and that uh, were in calf. Uh, but the, look, as the, as the growth conditions improve and the weather conditions uh, stabilise out, uh, look, there's no reason why that, those, those numbers won't be increased and we will be selecting cows perhaps that, that aren't in calf and are producing that bit more milk. Oh, absolutely. There's no reason whatsoever. I mean, if you're talking about September, October calf cows, like, I mean, they're, they're like, they're well settled into the routine now at this stage and they're well settled into, into lactation and like, they're probably got, they're going to over peak at this stage. Like here we are yes. in the March, you know? So, I mean, really, I mean, to be honest with you, for me, it'll only benefit all cows to get them out now sooner rather than later than, than, uh, cause you know, it just does a kind of a, a piece there in terms of, I'll call it cow welfare, cow comfort as well, in terms of getting them out and get them off concrete and kind of, and switching them into grazing. Cause it takes, it takes a couple of, I'd say, you know, weeks to kind of get into the grazing zone as well, Aidan, in terms of like the, the cows, if, if, if the sweets are inside, they'll stay eating sweets inside as long as, as long as they can, you know, but I mean, if they get into grass and getting out, they'll, they'll convert over to the grass and leave the silage, leave the silage inside. Yeah, well, I, I think, look, at, uh, James's experience, uh, you, uh, you may want to comment on this again, is that, look, you know, if the grass is there, they'll graze it and you know, they'll settle into it quick enough and, and, uh, Production wasn't severely affected last year, from what I remember, James, in terms of the milk being produced. No, no, we haven't. We haven't found a drop of production now. Last spring wasn't exceptionally good spring, but uh, generally, if you watch the way you work those cows and get them out and, and, and keep increasing it, you know, as the grass is there and as the weather is there, I don't see a problem as far as production going down. No. Right, folks, we've, we've spent a good good deal of time going through the various issues from starting off, I suppose, with the kind of, I suppose, the soil fertility side of things and then moving into the grazing side of things. So, we, I mean, we've come through um, a lot of the issues and we've discussed them, I suppose. Um, I mean, there's a couple of messages that are coming through. I suppose number one is primarily the soil fertility. Like, I mean, you need to establish, I suppose, where your individual paddocks are and you need to kind of continuously soil, soil analysis, I'll say, as, as Niall McCarran talked about, you need to soil it. Do, do what you can at least every, every, if not every year, every second year, I think is, is important to keep a handle on terms of your farm, in terms of soil fertility. Um, preparing a nutrient management plan obviously is key in terms of if, if you have silage ground, you need to fertilize it properly for silage and and uh, get that right because it's an expensive time of the year when you're buying fertilizer, especially the costs that are that are here this year in 2021. Um, get get your farm walked and get the, and, and plan to get your get a certain amount of your cows out. Aiden, I mean that come true loud yeah. and clear from you in terms of what yeah. what we need to do. I mean get 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 the walk in as as James King says. Listen, you 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 don't have to be 100 percent accurate, you know, but you I mean you, you get a feel for the farm in terms of, in terms of what's happening or what's not happening. Um, look for opportunities for turnout. I mean the, the weather is good at the moment. Obviously, does a there's going to rain come at some time sooner rather than later but I mean the ground uh, across the country has got a good a good chance to dry out over the last couple of weeks obviously on some heavy farms that's still not a still not a still not a um you know possible to get out to grazing but um but look at I think for for a lot more farmers there's a lot more grass on farms especially as if it has been planned from the autumn and with weather conditions the way they are there's a good opportunity there and as Niall McCarran said from Lakeland Dairies you know the quality will go up the protein will get better and you know I mean James King has said that yield hasn't especially in those autumn calving cows that are gone past peak which are the majority of cows across Northern Ireland so 
look at folks, I think we'll, we're kind of, we'll, we'll leave it at there. I mean, um, uh, uh, obviously it's important to get this out, the message out now in terms of getting, getting your soil sampling done. It might be too late for, for this year, but I mean, uh, it's, it's important maybe to, to plan it in for next January and December, maybe next year. Um, but now, now is the time for grazing and getting cows out. And, and James King is on his way to get these cows out in, in, in near Ballymena. So, I mean, it's, there's, there's, there's little excuse for anyone else when, when that can happen up that part of the country. Um, thanks to Aidan, uh, James, Niall and, and Peter McCann for, for giving their time for, to record this webinar. Um, and with that, stay safe and stay farming.